Dynamic braking? What is that? Hey guys, George's Soundtracks here. This week in our Operations 101, we're actually going to talk a little bit about dynamic braking. Now for the, those of you guys who use steam engines, this won't apply to you, but it's good information to know. Especially as the transition era happened, if you model around that time, you'll have a mix of steam and diesel. So this would be applicable to your diesel engines. <music> But first thing is, is dynamic braking. What exactly is that? Well, in our previous operations videos, we've talked about regular braking using the brake pads either on the locomotive with the independent or on the freight cars as your automatic. Now, in this particular case, we're not going to be using any braking of brake shoes or pads in any form. Dynamic braking is called dynamic because what it's doing is it's using the traction motors that are actually down on the axles. And as the, the inertia of the train pushes the locomotive down the track, those motors are turning. Well, when power is not applied to pull the train, the engineer it eliminates the power, and then those motors turning become generators. And it, those electromechanical generators are generating electricity. Now, in the case of dynamic braking, there's not much sound that's going to be associated with this except for the fans that are located on the top of the locomotive. Because inside your locomotive you have a grid of resistors. And in those resistors then you have a fan that's located nearby to draw air to blow air across the resistors to keep them from getting too hot. Now, not all models are equipped with dynamic braking, so this is something you'll want to check out, do some research with your particular railroad and or the model. For example, it's not necessarily always immediately intuitive. Uh, in the case of some of the early EMDs, especially the narrow hood diesels, you'd see the giant dynamic brake blister here located on top. Now, in the case of this SD40, you can see that there's no dynamic brake blister. There's no fans up here on this section here, so this locomotive actually would be without dynamic brakes. Now, in the case of this GEP42, it's a lot harder to tell because there's no extra fans. You only have the one fan. So in this particular case, the extra resistors are built into the radiator area here, so they're serviced by the same fans that run and cool the radiators. So all of this is it's a matter of just verifying what your model is. Do a little bit of research online, check out your model, check out your railroad and find out what you had for the different locomotives so that you can decide how you want to implement braking, whether you do have dynamic braking or don't, which we'll get to in just a moment. So it's that electromechanical resistance of the motors turning and while they're generating electricity that the engineers use in the locomotive to keep the train under control. Now that dynamic braking or that regenerative braking won't actually stop the locomotive, but it does bring the train down and slows it down so that descending a grade, especially in mountainous territories, the engineer can keep that train under control by forcing the train to generate the electricity basically. And then the application to the resistors is what helps progressively brake the locomotive. So like in, in the case of a car where you press the brake pedal and you press it harder to stop faster, kind of the same thing. This applies more resistors to slow it down. Now when it comes to model trains, the dynamic braking is a little bit harder to do since the whole thing is being powered by a motor that's running. So what we have to do is we have to simulate that using the decoder. So there's many different ways that the Soundtracks decoders have been built in to allow you to more prototypically reproduce the sound of the dynamic brakes. Now this sounds and the effects apply all the way back to our original Tsunami as well as the Econami, our Tsunami 2, and of course the Blue Nami. Now for today's example, we're going to show you the Blue Nami and we're going to use the screen record that you can see up here over my shoulder somewhere. But anyway, what we're going to do is the first thing is when we apply the dynamic brakes, we turn on the F4 function. And the F4 function, or in this case in the blue NAMI, you can see it on your screen, it's the dynamic brake label function. Now when we turn that on, the locomotive will then apply the sound effect. So by default, the first way that the dynamic brakes affect the prime mover is to just play the sound effect and the prime mover continues doing what it was doing. Now this is just how it operates out of the package. But in many cases, especially most early EMDs, you would have the prime mover would actually drop down to idle. 
And so there's no sense, again, revving the engine of your car while you're hitting your brakes. So here on my screen, you can actually see that I've got these choices. One is dynamic brake force the engine RPMs to drop to idle. The second one is to drop to notch four or go to notch four. Now the reason for that is because the traction motors as they're generating uh, electricity can get warm. And so some railroads specified that the dynamic brakes would apply the prime mover to notch four. And the reason was so that the main generator was generating enough electricity to guarantee that there was enough electricity to power the traction motor blowers so that they would keep the air going across them to keep them cool. Now, in, when you're dynamic braking, especially descending a hill, your grades can vary depending on how your terrain is. And so it's not a constant or a guaranteed voltage to be coming in from the traction motors. And so this is why notch four was addressed. The railroads that I'm familiar with that do this, the Missouri Pacific, the railroad that I typically model, now ignore for the moment that this doesn't have dynamic brakes. They did have some that were equipped with dynamic brakes. I'll get to that in a moment. But then there was also the Southern Pacific and of course the Rio Grande would all have those running so that that way the traction motor blowers would continue to run. Now in some of the early cases and some of the Alcos and some of the uh, early GEs, uh, they would actually notch up to notch eight. And the reason for that was because a lot of the early models the traction, or I'm sorry, the uh, fan motor was actually mechanically driven off the crankshaft. And so when you were dynamic braking, you wanted that added extra effort to blow air across the resistor grids. And so they would run up to notch eight to make sure that you had full airflow across the resistor grids. And so as you can see here in our decoder or in our uh, Blue Nami decoder here, we can see that we have all of this. So in the case of the P42s, it actually drops to idle. So we're gonna go ahead and select that. Now, in your other decoders, there is CVs to adjust this. In the Economy and Tsunami 2, it's CV114. And going back to the original Tsunami, it's CV116. So the other one here is that we actually have a braking rate. Now, for this particular uh, illustration, and we'll do some demonstrations here in a moment, I've actually got the prime mover set to drop to idle, but then we're also going to slow the locomotive more quickly as we apply our dynamic brakes. And that way we can see that the dynamic braking is actually done. Now in the real world, in the real engineers, you have what's called progressive braking. So as you apply more brakes, the locomotive stops faster, but we had to make this work for model railroading. And especially with our DCC systems and then of course the future Blue Nami, where we could just simply send a on off function command. So the way we did this is that function four, you basically turn it on and you'll hear the sounds kick on. And then you press it a second time if you're running slower than speed step 10, the dynamic brakes go off and everything goes back to normal. But if you're going faster than that, now you can implement a dynamic braking high where you can simulate the engineer apply more dynamic braking and that fan sound will actually increase. And then the second braking rate, or in this case, the dynamic braking rate would actually apply. So let's go ahead and just quickly show you some demonstration operations so we can get out of this and actually run some trains. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute my locomotive and I'm gonna get it running here. We'll say just a nominal speed step, somewhere around speed step 10 or so. We'll go ahead and move these locomotives out of the way so you can see what we're doing. Now, when I bring the locomotive to a stop, starting about here, you can kind of see that it takes a little bit, but eventually just cutting the throttle, the locomotive will come to a stop. But now when I go back, we're gonna go ahead and crank them back up again. Now, when I apply my dynamic brake sound, now it's running, we're going to go ahead and apply dynamic brakes. So now you hear that dynamic brake fan kick on, but the locomotive continues at its given speed. Now in this instance, I'm going to go ahead and get my locomotive moving a little faster. And then when I, come, when I apply the dynamic brakes, we'll start applying it right here. You can hear that dynamic brake fan kick on but the locomotive maintains and continues its given speed. Now this is just the base application of the dynamic brakes. But now when we're running, 
And we're going to go ahead and press the second application. Now you can hear those fans kick up and get louder, but now you notice the locomotive is actually slowing. And once it gets down to about 7 to 10 miles an hour, you can see that now it's maintaining its speed. The dynamic brake fans go down, and now basically we have our monitoring and you know, maintaining the speed. But when I release the dynamic brakes, dynamic brake fan kicks on, and our locomotive starts accelerating again. Now I realize this is difficult to show in a small tabletop environment, so I would encourage you to check out some of our previous videos that we've done on dynamic braking, showing the effects uh, in a more uh, spread out uh, environment. Uh, there was one we went to a local layout to kind of show how all this does. Now a couple other points I want to talk about dynamic braking. Now, when you're adjusting the brake rate, you can have it stop more quickly or you can take longer to slow down. Again, it depends on how you want to run your trains. And that's a setting in CV116 in our decoders or you can set it in uh, the Blue Nami app through the app. The other thing is you can adjust the volume and the volume you can adjust. Now, in this particular demonstration, I have the volume turned up quite loud so that that way you can hear it because it's accentuated. But there are some instances where you may want to adjust it down lower. Or in the case of this Missouri Pacific locomotive here, you didn't think I had this here just for show, did you? Now, in this particular locomotive, you can see that there's no dynamic brakes. And I'm going to go ahead and mute this locomotive here. Now, in the case of no dynamic brakes, you can have the locomotive behave the same as if it were dynamic brake, but then take the volume of the dynamic brakes and set it to zero. That way, if you consist this locomotive with, say, some other locomotives that had dynamic brakes and you want to use that feature, this locomotive doesn't just continue doing what it was doing. It will then behave. You'll hear the prime mover drop to idle as one of the settings we talked about. And then when we turn the dynamic brake volume to zero, you'll never hear that fan kick on. But then if you set the braking rate to match that of your dynamic brake equipped locomotives, they'll all run together in tandem, just like they should with every normal consist. So this is a very brief overview of the uh, dynamic brake functions that we built into the decoders. If you have any further questions, be sure to check out the user's guide in our website at soundtracks.com or feel free to give us a call at support and we'll be happy to help answer any questions we can for you and help explain this. But I encourage you to try it out. As with many of our Soundtracks decoders, you cannot break the decoder by changing CV. So I, I encourage you to try it out, experiment with it, see how it behaves, decide what you like and then run with it. And that way when you have all your locomotives running together, you can take one step closer to realistically operating your train. Thanks guys for watching. Be sure to like this video and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so that you can get notified each time we go live with a new video. And then also be sure to check out our new podcasts. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.